when there's tearing in your arteries, cholesterol is like uh, silly putty, or what's the, what's spackling, right? If you dent your wall, and you put that out there to make that wall smooth again, then you can paint over it. That's what cholesterol does inside of your arteries, right? It is essential to keep your, your uh, arterial system actually healthy, right? The problem is, is not when that cholesterol is nice and soft and waxy, you can have as much of it as you want in there. That's called arterial sclerosis, okay? Sorry, atherosclerosis. Arterial sclerosis is hardening in the heart, okay? In Japan, very, very low rates of heart disease, right? Right, like almost non-existent. When you look at their atherosclerosis levels, their amount of plaquing in their arteries, we Americans have a little bit more as we're younger. Japanese have way more than the average uh, American does when they're older. Yet they still have very low rates of heart disease. There's no correlation between atherosclerosis and actual heart disease. Okay, what is correlated is the amount of plaquing, or when that waxy, soft cholesterol plaquing begins to harden. Okay, and that's oxidation that causes that. You can have a lot of atherosclerosis or you can have a little bit. If there's, if there's hardening up or if there's uh, you know, oxidation of those plaques in your arteries, they tend to break off, that can cause a heart attack or a stroke. Okay, that's the risk factor. The fat that you eat, we're gonna talk about fat because it's one of the most important nutrients that you can ever eat. Fat does not cause heart disease. Eat away, eat your fat. Don't eat trans fat. Trans fat is not made in nature, trans fat is made in a Laboratory. laboratory. Again, if it's made in the laboratory, it'll probably kill you. Okay? Not a good thing, right? Eat your fats. It is good, healthy fats, right? Good, super important things for your body. Okay? Sugar is increases acidity and inflammation in the body. Increased free radical production is one of the biggest things that you can do to cause plaque and in, 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 contributes to heart disease. Okay? You want your tick in a little long time? <coughs> You can, I'll tell you right now, come to our heart disease workshop, lower your cholesterol is all you want. I will show you the research, you will die earlier with lower cholesterol levels. The older we get, the more cholesterol that we have in our bloodstream, the more protected we are. Like not just against heart disease, against disease in general. Okay, <clears throat> cholesterol, so fructose is, has to be broken down somewhere. And, and it, fructose is not, when you eat fructose, so this is like, okay, we have to go back and change, because I used to use agave nectar sometimes to sweeten. Agave nectar is totally fructose. Okay, 100% fructose. A lot of these are sweeteners, are, they're, it's like six times sweeter than sugar, I think, I don't know the number. High fructose corn syrup, this is what was, high fructose corn syrup is manipulated bonds from corn syrup, um, from just even regular fructose, to give you even more sweetening. And it's made from corn, and we can make a ton of it. Okay, uh, and so the lobbyists will tell you that it's totally safe for you. But here's the problem: is that all of this stuff is the body can't metabolize even high fructose corn syrup as well. It, fructose is normally metabolized in the liver; it's broken down in the liver. High fructose corn syrup, corn syrup is your body tries to break it down, but it can't even do a good job. Here's what happens: though the liver becomes overworked, breaking this down. The job of the liver is to produce <coughs> one of the main jobs is to produce cholesterol. Right? When the liver is overworked, you cannot produce enough cholesterol. And your cholesterol levels will actually begin to go down with things like uh, uh, if your liver becomes sick because you're eating too much fructose. Okay? Super important for cell membrane function. The biggest organ in your body, so your, your brain, half the weight of your brain is composed of cholesterol. Your cognitive function, neuronal function, uh, we're going to go over this a little bit later as well, but it is cholesterol is super important for brain function. <coughs> So when you lower cholesterol levels, you will make it hard, your like, cognitive functions begin to decrease. That's one mechanism by which sugar hurts the brain. I'll, talk, I'll go over another one. Okay, when you look on the back of your cholesterol or you look open the package of your cholesterol things, one of the things that you will see in there is one of the side effects is dementia and cognitive impairment. Right, and I've spoken to more people about this. They're like, I started taking my cholesterol and I just, my memory went. I'm like, yeah, like you, you're, you're stripping your cholesterol. Like when you take your Lipitor, it doesn't just take cholesterol out of your arteries. You're peeling it from everywhere in your body, including your brain. Like you're, I would say like the cholesterol in your nervous system is like the wiring that, that's going around all these circuits that we can't see. And if you take the wiring away, those wires are circuit, right? Your, your nervous system does exactly the same thing. Okay, so up your fats, lower, lower the sugars. We'll, we'll maybe touch on ketosis a little bit. Jeff, can I answer? 
what causes the cholesterol to oxidize? Well, inflammation or acidity in the body. So that, like, okay. it's it's the sugar, and it's not just sugar, but sugar, stress, okay, okay smoking, uh, anything that you're doing that's producing free radicals in the body will cause it to oxidize. Oh, okay. Or when there's, if you're increasing inflammation in the body, <coughs> or acidity levels. When acidity levels drop, so when you become acidic, I guess it would be acidity levels, right? So when pH levels drop, you become more acidic. That sets the body up so that free oxi this oxidation process, oxidation is a chemical reaction. Uh, it just happens more just all, when you take an apple, you bite into an apple, and the flesh goes from uh, you know fleshy to brown or whatever, right? That's oxidation. Okay? That's happening inside of like that happens inside of your body all the time. And your body's cleaning all that up, right? You, you neutralize these free radicals with certain substances. Can you grab me a water bed? Okay. Um, but uh, you know, we talked about the cancer workshop. Like, there are fruits out there that, if you if you're dealing with cancer, that even though that has higher sugar in it, that are loaded with antioxidants that your body can use to help buffer or neutralize some of these free radicals. That you have. Okay. So it's it's like getting you know your cholesterol levels measured. Like the, we talked about this in the it, it just like you're getting you know, measure your inflammatory levels. That will give you way better indication of what how your heart is going to be doing or what your what your risk of a heart attack is than just your cholesterol levels. Does that make sense to you guys? It just isn't. Yes, cholesterol has to oxidize, but the reason cholesterol is in your arteries is because it's actually protecting. It's trying to heal what the, the damage in their arterial cells. If you didn't have that at all, if we took all the cholesterol out of your body, you wouldn't last a minute. Like it's an essential nutrient. It's when it becomes oxidized that's the problem. And sugar is a huge contributor. Okay, and then fructose hurts the liver. When you hurt the liver, so this is like how Lipitor works, is it actually hurts your liver. <laughs> so it makes the liver work less, it like poisons the liver so that you produce less of your own cholesterol. That's how it works, right? Alzheimer's disease is, is now, so this shows you how, this wasn't even on the radar 20 years ago. They now expect, there, some people think that in the documentation can be a little bit more, but they think this will be the third leading, is now, and will be the third leading cause of death in America. Alzheimer's disease. Right? It went from nothing to now common. I hear this from patients all the time, and it will become incredible, just much more common than you look at the reasons why is because of our what else has gone up in the last 200 years, right? And specifically in the last 20 years, the amount of sugar that we consume. Okay. It's commonly thought that again, brain. We I've never been taught this in chiropractic school. Your brain cells run on glucose, right? Yes, they can. Your brain cells can run on glucose, but that's not their optimal state, right? They run best on ketones. Okay, which are produced from digestion of healthy fats. This is the whole premise behind the ketosis diet. Ketosis is where your body is actually using, you get your body in a state that's so different from what we are typically used to because we consume so many carbohydrates, right, and so much sugar. But you, when you eat a high fat, low sugar diet, your body actually starts to run on fat. And I have seen people go through uh, this ketogenic diet, which is very similar to the paleo diet, by the way, you just there's a little bit more specificity. If you really go hardcore, you measure like your salivary pH. Ketones are acidic, um, and sometimes you get bad breath from it, at least temporarily. Uh, and the first little bit, um, you'll be like just moody and crazy because sugar is very addicting. Right, that's one of the things that I was going to put a whole slide up about, like the addictive nature of sugar. I've read stuff that they think sugar is four times as addicting as, where's my thing of coke? Right, wherever the coke is, like literally cocaine, four times as addicting as cocaine. Right, and they think that, and this is, I read some stuff, they think that even, we, the, one of the big problems is that we get so much of our sugar now in liquid form, and liquid form seems to be even more addicting for some reason. Right? when you get, 40 grams of liquid versus, because it's easier to digest, your body doesn't have to go through the digestion. You don't get, if you had to eat something that was 40 grams of sugar, you would get fuller a lot quicker than when you drink it. Like no one drinks a can of milk and goes, I'm full, right? I would feel sick probably if I did that. 
right? But if you eat uh, two Snickers bars, which would be about 40 grams, probably, right? I don't know if one of the solids seem, seem to affect things a little bit differently, okay? Uh, what was I talking about? Yeah. Ketones. Ketones, ketogenic diet. Oh, I've seen people like go through this and lose weight quickly, which isn't always a smart thing because in your fat cells is where toxins get stored, <coughs> and you can you can really hurt yourself. You can really hurt your kidneys if you don't do it the right way because your body's going to filter on all these all these heavy metals, especially if they get stored in the fat of the body. All these toxins, environmental toxins, they get stored in the fat of the body. So that's super important. And, and here's the deal, I'm not, I, it just shows you how when you start, when you get your body in the state to actually burn fat, it's incredibly efficient at it. Right, Kelsey, who used, who used to work for us, still the patient of course, but um, she actually did a sugar detox for a while, which actually put her in that ketogenic state. She was miserable for the first two or three days, like headaches, like withdrawal, like drug withdrawal, that's what she felt like. Right, but after that, she's like, my energy levels and my mental clarity and mental thought are superb. Um, at, we came to our smoothie workshop. Anyone? Anne, I know you were there for that. We did the bulletproof coffee. Remember we talked about the bulletproof coffee? That is when bulletproof coffee is, you, you actually, with coconut oil mixing in there, the fact you're giving the brain this a tremendous amount of fat to use as fuel, and I'm telling you what, maybe it's a placebo effect, but I don't, I'm, I just, I can't, I'm not a huge fan of coconut. Uh, Oil. So I don't do it bulletproof coffee all that often, but I, when I do it, I, when I have it in the morning, I'm telling you what, I, my mental focus, I just feel like, just feel sharp, right? And you give the brain the right fuel, it's gonna work better. What's bulletproof coffee? So it's uh, basically, it's, it's kind of weird if you're a coffee purist, which I am, which is why I have trouble. It's coffee, and you usually, like, you maybe make a, you know, a cup of coffee, and you put maybe a tablespoon or two of grass-fed whole butter, in the coffee, and then a tablespoon of coconut oil or MCT oil, uh, which is just medium chain triglycerides, which are found in coconut oil, but it's a concentrated dose. I'm a little skeptical of doing anything concentrated, uh, just because that's probably more than the body can handle. And you blend it up, and you drink it like it, it, it's kind of like a latte, <laughs> but it's salty. If you get unsalted butter, that will help. Salted what? butter again. It's grass fed. If you get yeah, like, yes, yeah, so you want grass fed. You want the healthiest fats yeah. in that butter that's possible. And butter and cheese. Do we have cheese here tonight? Yeah, don't forget cheese. Butter and cheese. Like I'm not a dairy fan, but butter and cheese. These are great things, right? A, you know, and even yogurt. It's fermented. It's got a lot of sugar. It can get kefir. Still got some sugar in it. But you want to get it's the sugar that's a problem. It's not the dairy portion then that's the problem. Fermentation is a good thing. So. And you can research bulletproof coffee, it's a good thing. Now the guy who created it kind of franchised it, and now you can buy like their special coffee, it's called like, what are the coffee beans called? Something like high velocity coffee beans or something stupid. Uh, it's, but the secret isn't in the coffee, right? It's, it's, it's in the fat that you're getting in your body. I have, I don't do that, I have, every morning I have four eggs, it's my breakfast, every single morning, four eggs, for probably, I don't know, two years, a lot of chicken sacrifice for me. <laughs> That's the reason we don't have a chicken population problem. But I'm trying to get, I'm trying, you know, I'm trying to get as much fat into my, especially in the morning. In the morning, you want all that fat. Super good. Your kids, you send your kids off to school. Well, so what do we feed our kids in the morning? Well, let's finish brain function, and then we'll get to the kid thing. So it's better for the body to run on ketones. Now, just like the body, the cells in the body can become insulin resistance. Your brain actually, so your pancreas releases. Your brain is kind of separated from your body. Right, because your brain is so, I mean, if your brain shuts down, you shut down, right? That's why you're here, hopefully getting adjusted because you understand that connection. So the brain is something called the blood-brain barrier, which makes it really hard for things to pass through. It's not impossible, right? That's what drugs do when they get past the blood-brain barrier and make it hot, right? But it stops a lot of the stuff in your, like oxygen is very damaging uh, to, and like blood itself is very damaging to, to the actual brain cells. So sugar kills brain cells outside and they use it for fuel. But how, how it works. The dry short will it just shuts down and kills brain cells. Okay? Anyway. So your brain has to produce its own insulin. Okay? Uh, just like the cells of your body become insulin resistant, your brain cells, if you're eating too much sugar, your brain has to compensate for that and it has to try to you're dumping more insulin to store it in these what are called the astrocytes, okay, which are like fat cells for the brain, basically. Okay? Your brain cells become insulin resistant as well. And when they 
they'll shut down and then they don't start taking anything. And you need glucose is, and, and, and ketones, when you shut insulin down, you're not even uptaking ketones. So your brain is being starved of fuel. And to build new neuronal synapses and learn new things, you require just you like when you learn something, if we look at your brain on a PET scan, PET scans measure basically it's like oxygen and I think even like it's fuel consumption, they measure how sugar is being burned in your brain. We can measure when you learn something, like it fires off and your body's using fuel, sugar, to, to burn your brain, or ketones, right? We don't burn ketones anymore, we just burn sugar. Okay? And you can measure that. When your brain becomes insulin resistant, you can't do that. And this is a huge thing. Um, studies show that higher blood glucose levels were associated with a smaller bone. Brain cells become insulin resistant as well, which can impair memory and learning. I got two things up here. So Alzheimer is a problem with the hippocampus uh, in the brain. Dementia studies show that higher blood glucose levels were associated with a smaller hippocampus. So when you have high blood sugar levels, the hippocampus is shrinking. That's a hallmark sign of Alzheimer's disease. Research from the Mayo found that diets rich in sugar are associated with an 89% increased risk for dementia, while high fat diets, complete opposite, had a 44% reduced risk. That's a, what, 90 to 40 is 130% swing, right, in risk for dementia and Alzheimer's. Fats are protective for things like dementia, and even for brain function. Like when your kids go to school, you gotta give them fats in the morning. You can't give them sugar. That's not gonna help them learn. They're gonna be jumping in their seat and we wonder why you know, the kids come home and they're ADHD. <coughs> we give them rocket fuel to burn, and that's not, their brains don't learn as well. And they're probably, uh, most of our kids are even insulin resistant, at least to some level. So this is where in the morning especially, you gotta get, start giving your kids fat. The smoothie workshop that we did, we did some of those. We used coconut milk and coconut oils to help get a, a big dose of, of, you know, the, we called it the, the berry brain booster. So there was fruits in it, but they were berries. Okay, so that's got there's some good stuff. And there's some lower glycemic index fruits as well. So you're still getting sugar in that, no question, but it's not going to be, it's fruit sugar, not added sugar, right? It's all, all natural. I think coconut milk, you can put fish oil in there, all that sort of stuff. Okay, eggs, give your kids eggs in the morning. Real eggs. Yeah, real eggs. Grass fed eggs. Like, from a real chicken. Yeah. <laughs> There's a difference. Oh, yeah. The, 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 like, uh, you, you can have two cows, one you keep in a pen and feed corn, the other one you let run around, right, and eat grass, and that one will be tastier, it will be tastier, and fatter, <coughs> and sell for more money. This one, the fats in it, you're going to have omega 3 fats in a cow. Where do we get omega 3 fats from? Fish. Fish, right? I thought they just came with fish. Why? Anything wild will produce omega 3 fats. Right? We just don't even buy anything wild anymore. Even for you hunters. Should a deer this year? No. No? If you did, you're still screwed because what did that deer eat? Corn. Corn. Because that's what we grow on. Right? And so like, the, the deer is insulin resistant. Basically, right? He's not, the deer's not eating grass. He's fat and tastes really good. Right? And it, honest to God, I have it. if you have a deer that eats corn and a deer that's grown on grass, it, it tastes different. Right? It tastes different. Um, additionally, when the liver is busy digesting fructose, okay, so we talked about this earlier, right? So if you're producing less cholesterol, if it's busy working on fructose, it's not producing <coughs> cholesterol, then your brain doesn't have as much cholesterol, and that will also impair cognition and learning. I think that's our last slide. Um, Questions about that? Might not be immediate death by sugar, but it will be a slow death by sugar. Like it's, I really have, like there's a couple big things that I feel, and this is easy for me, it's easy for me to set up time because I never really have sweet tooth. I like pies and I like Reese's peanut butter cups. My two things, when I was joking with a patient today, she's like, I don't really love sugar. She's like, I'd rather have pickles. I'm like, me too. I drink pickle juice. We keep the jars afterwards, and I drink the stinky pickle juice. I love it. Like that, that's way better to me. Your pie is probably gonna be phenomenal. I'm super excited, especially around Thanksgiving, right? But I just have never had a major. I don't crave sugar. Like pop for that, but I can miss it. My life wouldn't change, right? If you said no more pickle juice, I'd be upset. That's a problem. I'm pregnant. <laughs> So it's easy to talk about, but when you look at like the things that we can do that are easy for health, easy, vitamin D, 
increasing vitamin D. So getting the sun in the summer without your sunscreen or orally taking it in the winter. Like, vitamin D is so important and we're all so deficient in it. Increasing healthy fats, right? From your fish oils, from even your animals. Eat your good healthy egg yolks. So important. Cutting down sugar, start sweating a little bit. Get, like, get your blood flow moving. How to apply your brain, like, healthy spines to the group. And when you, you know what's amazing? Is that when you do those things, when you eat less sugar and you move your body, how much better shape is your spine into? Right? It's just in better shape. You're under less stress. You don't cause the luxations, but you can do everything right. Something shifts, pinch your bone to your heart, heart's not going to function either. Like, that's a, that's a pretty important thing. But that, I'm a huge probiotic. <laughs> Right, getting good healthy bacteria, eating your fermented foods, like gut bacteria, vitamin D levels, increasing fats, decreasing sugars. Like if you can put yourself in that situation and stay there, life is just like <coughs> energy levels, mental focus, all that stuff is gonna be better. It doesn't mean you never have a symptom or that you're never gonna get sick. I mean, that, I still get sick once in a while. I mean, again, I always talk about this, you guys are probably sick of hearing it, but We've raised our kids generally this way. My kids still eat too much sugar. And they're still on the iPad too much. Okay, but we give them tons of fat, and they've been adjusted since birth. So I've got a nine-year-old, a six-year-old, a three-year-old, and a one-year-old, right? We've never had ear infection once. Never had step throat. They've, what are the other common kid things? Who will be caught? Yeah, no, they've never. And, but that's because they've been vaccinated. Oh wait, no, never been vaccinated. <laughs> And they were around kids with whooping cough who were vaccinated. And I'm like, how funny is this, right? We get a call from the, the babysitter. She's like, I'm so sorry. She was freaking out because she knew our kids. She was like, <coughs> she vaccinated her kids, regretted it, whatever. I, this is not a vaccine talk. God bless you, whatever you decide to do. It's a crazy world. Yeah, you got to do what you think is best, okay? But their kids were vaccinated, had whooping cough. We didn't find out until later. I had a three-year-old, and it was probably Quinn was about a one-year-old, maybe a four-year-old, one-year-old, or Liam, rather, at that time. She called us in a panic. She's like, your kids? Well, they were around my kids and they just got diagnosed. All three of her kids got whooping cough. And our kids were there for weeks on end, right? Every Tuesday for weeks. Of course, never a stitch. And I, at some, and I'm going to do this. I'm going to get my oldest son, because he's old enough to take a needle now. They've never had needles, so they don't know what it's like. I'm going to draw their blood. I'm going to measure, get their titers pulled, measure what they, you can look at their antibodies and see what they've been exposed to, right? And what the body fought off naturally because it's working. Right, that'll be fun. So anyway, yes. What about like sprouted grains and stuff? So that's a, you know, some grains are bad. <coughs> right? We would say that you know, again, and yeah, there's some fiber in grains, but there's nothing that you would eat in grain that you shouldn't be getting from other foods anyway. They're delicious and convenient, but we talked about that in our paleo workshop. Grains, grains are a carbohydrate that's still in the end. Even your carbs, like even your your it still turns into sugar. Again, you need some sugar, right? But grains are gonna grains are gonna produce higher higher sugar levels. Sprouted grains are a different beast. They're you treat them more like a vegetable almost than you would a grain. So are they like are they still bad though? Like anyway. Everything in moderation, like I wouldn't tell you yeah. how to sprout diet. <laughs> yeah. Right? You can die from drinking too much water. Everything in moderation. Starches are sprouting out, which is what happens. That's why your body digests so many vegetables. Yeah. So where do um like um flour, coconut flour, where do those things fall away? Glycemic indexes or sugar levels? In general, yeah. Like how how big? <laughs> well, I mean, listen, if I you're. I know I hold food, but. Yeah, I I think it's funny because we try and make like I, we get so attached to things food wise. That like, I, I would say, uh, again, like if there's some reason that my wife loves, and it was fine, but she made cookies with almond flour, I think, mm -hmm. and it, like they tasted fine, they tasted good, but I, so I don't know the answer to that. I haven't done enough research into that. Okay. Here, here's I think my argument with this. I just think it's a little bit silly. Like we try and make healthy food into unhealthy, food, right? Like we we do the paleo diet and. Uh, we get we go on emails is the is the website we use and every week it costs us like five bucks a month and they send us a list like a, a weekly meal plan. I think that's the hardest part about eating healthy is what you're gonna do, right? With a shopping list and all that sort of stuff. And like they use cauliflower for everything. Like they try and mimic it makes like mashed potatoes out of cauliflower 
And you know, it's fine. I'm like, let's just eat cauliflower. Let's try and stop turning it into food that we want. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it, it, if you can eat, if you eat good, then just make like unless you can't unless. You, well, I'm, I'm gluten free, so. Right, and there is no gluten in that. Reasons. Right, so that's why I substitute that yes. with certain things. But yep. I just was curious. I just want to know what. Sugar wise. What that's doing, right? Like compared to, let's say, flour. Yeah. I understand because like the nut flours are just literally like you can make it by just trying out your own almonds or kind of like trying out and it all up and it's just brown. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, there's lots of good fat in that, so right. I don't know the answer to that. I'd have to go look and see. Okay. But, Just curious. Okay. Yeah. Like I think something. I, my wife did once buy a cake that was. She bought a cake. This it was when our oldest, second oldest, turned one. It was horrible. I'm like, just give the kid cake. Like, it's his first birthday, right? Like, I, that's just my opinion. I feel like we try and cheat sometimes, by, but no one's satisfied with like the substitute. So yes, I had cookies that were made with almond flour, and it just tasted fine with me. Yeah. Uh, you know, so if it's horrible, I would just say try to eat really good, and then just use your flour and make cookies once in a while. But let's not have that be a thing. <coughs> but that's good. I, I'll let, I mean, we need to. I'll have to look into that. And I didn't talk about flour tonight because that's not technically added in flour. And that's, it's just the grain that we're talking about. That's not an added sugar. Like really, I think the focus was this was all the stuff that gets added in after the fact that we make. Like bread uses flour, but also <coughs> excuse me, sugar that gets added in. Right. So you and need body, some carbohydrates. Doesn't that turn that into sugar? Like yeah, all carbohydrates at the end so turn into glucose. Right, okay. Yeah. So even your vegetables. That have some cover up, like even your vegetables. Like on the, one of the slides, you guys have it on there, but it showed like asparagus. I think it's still there's still sugar even in vegetables. They're just very low amounts. Any carbohydrate in the end gets turned into glucose or it's fiber. It's either fiber, like when you eat a vegetable, the fiber, and then the sugar in there gets pulled out as well. So you can eat as it's so low in there, you're getting so much fiber that that's why we always say like you can eat as much. Like if you want to just eat as much vegetables as you want, like go ahead, you probably would be fun to be around. For digestive reasons. But it'd be good. Any other questions? So honey, no, maple syrup, I mean like real hundred percent sweet on street tap. Yeah, I got Canadian, so maple syrup. Sweeter and sweeter. Sugar, sugar, sugar. Yeah, so like and I one of the things I took on was the artificial sweeteners, so still sugar, honey, sugar, agave, still sugar. And that doesn't mean, again, what you have to know is how much are you consuming. If you had, if you had a tumor in your body, if you had brain cancer, I would say as close to zero as you can get sugar, right? If you exercise and you work out and you know you're you're do the 25, do the 35 grams. I mean, this isn't the thing. The only reason I don't like putting up the 25 and 35 is because, like, people look at that and go, "When I did the paleo diet hardcore, like paleo diet, if you go hardcore is even raw. That's really hardcore. But like, not even fruits. Okay, I don't go. I can't do that because I lost so much weight. Like, I I I got down to 145 pounds when I was hungry, which was. It was way just, I just burned, I was, I have a high metabolism, whatever, right? So it's easy for me to almost feel like, <coughs> but I just, it was too, it was too much. So I had to add more carbohydrates in for my diet. So it, the 25 isn't right for everyone. It, and this is the hard part. And we all want, we all want someone to say, just tell me what I should eat. There's no magic number for every person. Like different people have different body types and you, and it, it's, for some other person to see where you should be, there's a lot of factors that go into that. I think you kind of got to base it off of what your goals are. 